Welcome to the Dolby Music Community Sessions. I'm Ben Guyvers with the Music Partnerships team at Dolby Laboratories based in Los Angeles. And in this session, our special guest, David Rosen, Vice President of Cloud Applications at Sony Electronics, will share an overview of Sony C, the cloud-based platform that allows for collaborative Dolby Atmos mix previews for QC and approval, as well as secure file sharing and metadata management. So this is a very cool and robust solution meeting the needs of the creative community and industry and is used by major labels as well as independents managing ADMs. So David will share a demo of how Sony C works and answer your questions. Stay tuned for that coming up in just a moment. You don't want to miss this one. We also have from Dolby Institute, Brandon Nales and producer and mixer Oscar Obi Brown here to share the latest on the Dolby Atmos Music Accelerator program and new website updates. The Accelerator is an educational initiative providing participants with practical training, guidance and online resources from Dolby and professionals enabling music creators to produce their own original music in Dolby Atmos and equipping them with all the skills to kickstart their careers as Dolby Atmos music creators. Brandon and his team have grown this program to a global level over the past few years, and Obi has gone from a participant to mentor, and they'll share the goals of this program and how new creators can get involved now. Really cool stuff with Dolby Institute, as always. That's coming right up. As always, my partner Greg Strike Chin is here from Miami to join the conversations and share part two of his three-part series on creating original music in Dolby Atmos and deriving your stereo mix using the Stereo Direct feature. So we go inside the studio and inside the mix with Greg, exploring his techniques for creative empowerment and pushing new workflows forward. It's great stuff as always with Greg, so hang tight for that. You can, of course, enter your questions for our guests here in Big Marker, and please enter your name so we can address you in response to your question. Also, zap the QR code on screen now to opt into the Dolby Creators mailing list to be sure you're up to date with all the latest sessions, tools, updates, and events. Uh, this takes you to the Pro site, so scroll down to the bottom of the page uh, to the form, which is where you enter your info. Um, also, of course, at the pro site is where you'll find all of our resources, including the quick start and deep dive tutorials, uh, the robust knowledge base and FAQs, also the user forum where you can ask questions and interact with our amazing team of engineers. Uh, you can also find the best practices documentation there for studios, as well as the studio directory and all of our past music community session videos are there and at our YouTube page as well. All right, let's jump into our conversation with Brandon and Obi will then have Greg Strike Chin, followed by Sony's David Rosen. All right, very happy to welcome Dolby Institute's Associate Music Program Manager, Brandon Nales, and multi-instrumentalist, producer, engineer, and Dolby Atmos Music Accelerator veteran, Oscar Obi Brown. Welcome, guys. Great to see you, and thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Glad to be here. Awesome. So, Brandon, let's start with you. Um, so many outside of Dolby probably don't know that you actually helped produce our community sessions a few years back. And so the sessions are super familiar to you. And um, although we share a lot of the great work that you and the Institute do on these sessions, I think this is actually the first time you've been in front of the camera for a session. So it's long overdue, my friend. Welcome. Um, can you share a little bit about your role at Dolby and the mission of Dolby Institute? Of course. So, you know, as much I'm Brandon Nallis and I lead the global music programs for the Dolby Institute. And my job is pretty much just to help emerging music creators by connecting them to mentorship from Dolby professionals and music industry uh, experts as well. And my role is to provide hands-on experience uh, with Dolby Atmos tools and in-person and online resources to help these music creators create their first songs in Dolby Atmos. Awesome. Well, you do so much great work and we've shared a lot of it on these music community sessions. And one of the cool in-person things that you do is the Dolby Atmos Music Accelerator program that you developed um, going a few years back and we've seen really grow and, and become global. So congrats on that. Can you share a bit about the program structure and, you know, the goals of the Accelerator? Yeah, the the main purpose of the Accelerator is just to guide these music creators uh, through the Dolby Atmos ecosystem, which of course you are very helpful in doing as well. Um, and I really want to walk these music creators through ideation to creation to distribution of their content in Dolby Atmos. Um, so when we have our in-person programs, we're you know doing listening sessions to analyze Dolby Atmos mixes from some of their favorite artists just to get their their minds thinking around that. 
We have some hands-on workshops as they begin their mixes on laptops and headphones, a pair of wired headphones, just so that they can get started and learn how to work in a doll that they're familiar with. Um, and then once we get towards the end of these programs, then we head into a uh, minimum seven, one four Dolby Atmos studio, just to reference these mixes and make any necessary adjustments and tweaks before they actually print that mix and they're ready to distribute it. Um, and then we walk them through that distribution process. And then once that music is up, um, you know, on, on enabled streaming services, then we have regular check-ins with them just to make sure that they're still comfortable with creating, if there's anything that they need additional support with um, and answer questions as they continue their careers creating content in Dolby Atmos. Nice. And you've really grown it to uh, and taken it globally over the past few years as well. Yeah. Yeah. We had, we our, last year we went to, uh, so we had a program in Miami. We had a, a really popular program at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. We hosted one at our headquarters in San Francisco. And then we had our first international one in Berlin, Germany. Um, and we've also had a program, you know, in Los Angeles as well. But that is uh, pretty much kind of foreshadowing what we're getting ready to do moving into next year is kind of taking these resources and expanding it globally. Love it. I want to get into more of that in a second. But Obi, you were a member of the Accelerator at South by in 2023. And it's it's crazy because it seems like it was a lot longer ago than 2023, doesn't it? When you think yeah, about absolutely. it. But <laughs> you came into that as a musician, but also from a producer and a mixer standpoint. Can you share a little bit about your background and, and kind of how you got into the Accelerator? Yes. Yeah, so um, I, of course, multi-instrumentalist, producer, engineer, pretty much whatever the artist needs, I try to be that for them. And um, I'd been hearing about this immersive new way to listen to music and all that stuff and how it was really becoming, it was taking off and it felt inaccessible to me. And through various music communities that I'm a part of, um, an artist and I were able to go to one of the listening sessions hosted by Brandon. And, um, you know, my, my mind, my, my eyes were opened, you know, my, my mind exploded. And um, from there, we're just able to tap into some of the resources that Brandon is talking about here. Nice. Well, it seemed like at the South by session, you know, it, it seemed like you really took to kind of mixing in the understanding of, of Atmos straight away. And it was something that was, you know, speaking to you and, and you were feeling passionate about. And um, you and Leia worked together at South by. And then following that, you you finished mixing her EP together and were able to share that with friends and family at a playback event in, in L.A. at Dolby's Hollywood Screening Room where you guys actually also performed live, which was cool. So how was that experience and how was taking kind of what you learned at the accelerator and hearing your mixes then translate into a cinema room? Um, how'd that make you feel kind of come in full circle with all of that? It felt surreal. Um, just, I'm sure there's a ton of, I'm, I'm positive. There were tons of, of very technical and, and nerdy things that had to happen behind the scenes for what ended up kind of becoming a rather intuitive process. So um, for it to eventually become so easy for my ideas in my head to translate in the physical world was, uh, there's no words really describe the first time you really feel the full ideation of your creation. So it was just, it was, it was amazing. So Obi, can you share a little bit about Leia, the Leo's record or the Purpose EP that you uh, helped produce in uh, Mix in Dolby Atmos? Absolutely. So that record was very special to her, especially but both of us, because it was very honest, very introspective. And we, when we created it, it was created as if it, it was to a movie. And so we were always kind of limited to a stereo field, you know, before we had the resources that Brandon made available to us. And when we went down to Austin, Texas for the South by Southwest Accelerator, we went full in and took our most complicated song in and it was magical. So from there, we were able to, you know, network with some people and meet more of the Dolby team or the Dolby family, including yourself, Ben, and um, got to actually finish the rest of the EP in Atmos. And we were able to uh, showcase that with like a, a EP release party at the theater on Hollywood and Vine and um, had all of our family, our, our you know, industry contacts and everything there. And we were able to play back our creation in Dolby Atmos at a you know at a enabled theater and it was spectacular. We were able to perform our EP, you know, a couple of select songs right in front afterwards. And just the the way that the access that we had to these resources made us look and feel as if we belonged in this industry. And it was a huge jumping point for her 
And the clientele that I've been able to get afterwards has been unmatched. So yeah, it's been a great experience. And you've also now become actually a mentor for the Accelerator program, kind of bringing what you've gained from the program and certainly learned on your own to, you know, most recently the Accelerator program a few months back at, at Fab Factory. So share a little bit about that experience and, and how it felt to kind of be able to, to give back to the next generation coming from what you had learned going through these. Absolutely. One thing that I've been loving about the way that Dolby is approaching this is that it's very community based, very outreach based and very much so like the gatekeeping that that's been holding the industry kind of stagnant for a long time doesn't seem to exist within this company. So it's been so great to be able to receive resources firsthand and then now to be able to pour back into my fellow creatives and engineers and musicians and just, you know, industry people and really progress the art. Hopefully this will take off and become the new standard so that um, everyone can really experience art the way it's meant to be experienced. Nice. So Brandon, you've created a lot of new video training material for and from the program. Um, can you share a bit about how that continues to evolve and, and how you see kind of the next iteration of the accelerator going forward? And while also, you know, providing resources for people that they can sort of access without having to be like live and in person uh, to be able to, to get some of it. Yeah, I think, you know, for this program, it's really important. I mean, we've gotten a lot of great feedback from music creators like Obi um, that these resources are needed and they're really excited to have them. Um, for us, you know, it's really cool to have something that is impactful for these artists, but it doesn't make sense if only a few of them can actually access it. So. We worked really hard this year to create some new tutorials and uh, implement some uh, exercise content as well and revamp our accelerated website so that it doesn't really matter if you don't live in a major music hub like Los Angeles or Berlin, you can still access the mentorship and the tutorials and the exercises um, so that you can explore Dolby Atmos music creation the way that Obi did when he first experienced it. And once we have that, you know, that, that website is, is live now, um, you know, anyone can access that on the on, uh, institute.com. Um, and now, you know, just kind of moving forward for us, it's really about just kind of taking these programs and these resources, expanding it globally and continuing to create this uh, this community of emerging music creators so that they can, you know, connect with one another, connect with us um, and continue to explore and, and take the, their craft, you know, further into the Atmos. That's awesome, man. So, Obi, what's next for you? What's on the horizon? I know you're a busy man traveling the world. Yes, yes. Um... There's all types of tours, all types of records, but a lot more of Atmos. I'm um, currently on the tour I'm at. I'm on now. I'm very excited because I'm taking the entirety of my of the checks from these and I'm building out my Atmos room in my studio. And so uh, I can't wait to go and look at the uh, starting that sentence over. I can't wait to then go and use the resources Dolby has available for me to create my own Dolby Atmos studio. So um, that's up next. Just more, more music, more love, more happiness, more immersive, everything. Thanks for sharing that. All right. So as Brandon mentioned, check out Dolby.com slash Institute for more on the Music Accelerator and really all of the fantastic programs that the Institute team does to empower the next generation of creatives with Dolby Technologies, not only Dolby Atmos, but Dolby Vision as well. Um, of course, there's a ton of resources at the Institute site for creating and mixing music, um, including the Essentials course, which is available in five languages, deep dive tutorial videos, creator talks, and, and more. So um, if you have questions for Brandon and Obi, drop them into the questions function here in Big Marker. And guys, thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, we are back with part two of Greg Strike Chin's Creating an Atmos Pro Tips. Over to you, Greg. All right, thanks, Ben. So we're back for part two, as Ben said, of our Creating an Atmos uh, uh, demonstration. So if you remember last time, we kind of set up a little bit of a template. So you can see here, I've got some of my essentials, uh, my bed tracks, uh, and then uh, I've got one object, and then we're going to keep it really simple for this demo. So we'll just, I'll do a, you, know, you can see that I've actually done a little bit of arrangement here uh, from, from, you know, from last time. So we've built the track uh, out a little bit. Again, very simple. This is not meant to be, I'm not, you know, going to win a Grammy on this thing. This is really meant to keep it simple so everyone can follow along. So I'll do a, a just really quick playback. So kick drum, some electric keys. And then we'll get some, we'll build up into some drums. All right, then we've got some, some stuff with the bass line here. 
right? And of course we have our break. We come back in uh, into the track with some additional little loops. And then of course our arpeggio, which is our, our object. Unmute that. So here we are in the in the uh, you know section of uh, creation where this is the this is the spot where everyone's used to. This is the spot we've been talking about for years, which is you know uh, you know, mixing uh, in Atmos, taking all your assets and mixing them. Nothing has changed here, everyone. That's the good news. Now, of course, I've made a lot of creative decisions from the get go because I'm creating an Atmos where I'm I was writing and doing everything from from the uh, actual start. So you'll notice here that in this track, um, for instance, in my bed, my drums, my, my, my groove cell uh, plugin, this is all still MIDI, MIDI information that is outputting audio from the plugin. Uh, same thing with the arpeggio. Um, this is all MIDI coming out from synth cell. Now, one of the things I just wanted to quickly mention here, again, your workflow in terms of mixing doesn't change. Uh, you've, you've now had the added benefit of creating these assets from the get-go and being able to make some decisions in terms of uh, placement, uh, you know, uh, perhaps, um, you know, automation for uh, an object that might move around the space, whatever. Um, but now you're in the, 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 the mix phase. And the thing I just wanted to quickly mention here, for those of you who are going to be leveraging um, virtual instruments and MIDI, uh, make sure... Uh, a really great practice is to make sure you go ahead and print that information uh, to audio and then uh, move on from there. So in the case of something like uh, these, this uh, play cell keys uh, in Pro Tools, it's really easy to do that. Your DAW may, may be a little bit different uh, where you can export something and re-import it back into the session. But for instance, here in Pro Tools, I can just simply right click on that track, click commit. And then I'm going to go ahead and commit that to audio. Now, when you commit that to audio, you're going to want to make sure. Now, you, here we have our audio here right underneath our uh, our virtual instrument track. I'm going to go ahead and hide that. I don't need it. So I'm going to right click on it and uh, hide and make it inactive. And now I just have the audio left. And we just want to make sure that this still exists in the bed. Now, of course, if I wanted to change that, if I wanted to, you know, for whatever reason, maybe I wanted to go ahead and have this uh, be an object instead, I totally have the uh, ability to do that. But we're going to leave it right there in the bed. So, again, for this, uh, you know, uh, tips and tricks number two, the main thing I want to just make sure I, I, I relay to you guys is that your workflow, uh, if you're comfortable with it, uh, and as you've been kind of growing and expanding in uh, Adobe Atmos, remains the same. You don't really have to change much. It's just that you have now the added benefit of having the front piece of it, which is the creation piece that you've done, which is what we kind of talked about in part one. So we're going to end things here for part two. Again, it was very quick, uh, but you know, this uh, we've got a lot going on on this uh, on this community sessions uh, for this one. So I wanted to make sure we we, we uh, you know give plenty of time there. So uh, next time, part three, we're going to talk about Stereo Direct and deriving that stereo mix from your uh, Adobe Atmos file. So until then, I'll say thanks and back to you, Ben. That's awesome, Greg. Thank you for sharing that. If folks have questions for Greg, please enter them into the questions function here in Big Marker, and we'll get to those shortly. All right, very pleased to welcome our guest today, David Rosen, Vice President of Cloud Applications and Solutions at Sony Electronics. Welcome, David. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thanks, man. Excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you and excited to have you share how Sony C Media Cloud Platform is being used by creatives for Dolby Atmos. But um, if you would maybe just start sharing a little bit about your role with the Sony Electronics, professional solutions, and um, sort of what your team does to, to service the industry. Yeah, you bet. So um, I head up a group within Sony Electronics called Media Cloud Services, and uh, we're responsible for bringing to market a uh, media management collaboration platform called C Media Cloud. And uh, what that basically enables is the management of content, the collaboration around that content uh, from anywhere, uh, regardless of where you are. Uh, so my team's responsible for building that, marketing that, uh, and servicing that uh, globally. Well, I think one of the 
most interesting main features is to allow for these remote previews and approvals of Dolby Atmos files in the cloud. And um, this is a solution that's being used by both majors and independents, right? So the UMGs, the WMGs, of course, SMEs of the world, but also indie labels and, and indie creators can harness the power of this platform as well. Can you share a little bit about the platform itself and, and how it's used? Yeah, you bet. And that's, that's right. C is actually used from, by the largest media companies in the world uh, to the smallest independents. Uh, literally, somebody can go to cmediacloud.com and just sign up for a, um, for a free account and they can try it out. Uh, and then, of course, we've got enterprise accounts, which um, you know are, again, for those larger organizations. Um, but it's used primarily for central storage and a central repository of media content, right? So we've all worked uh, in this area long enough where people are uploading files to various consumer grade, you know, cloud management platforms, uh, which are, you know, good in their own right, but they weren't really developed for rich media, especially when you start talking about really large files. Um, so C is really focused purely on managing media content, whether it's video or audio or images, editing projects, et cetera. Uh, you can certainly upload anything you want, documents and, and uh, presentations, and C handles those perfectly well, but uh, its bread and butter is really on media. Um, so it's used across the whole media lifecycle. Uh, you've got people who are collaborating on work in progress content, and I think we'll touch on that a little bit today because I think it's really kind of vital to this audience. Uh, but then also for storing, you know, final masters. Uh, you know, we've heard some terrible stories of warehouses burning down and masters being at risk. Um, C kind of solves for that by making sure that the content is stored uh, in the cloud in lots of different locations, just in case anything ever does go wrong. Um, so central media archive. And importantly, it's all web accessible, so it doesn't matter where you are in the world, uh, you can get access to that content. Uh, you can review it, you can collaborate, adding comments, et cetera. Uh, you can even manipulate that content. So if you wanted to, for instance, uh, take out a sample of um, you know, a lar larger video, you can just clip that out, you can transform it into different formats if you need to send it to somebody. Uh, and you can also share that content out directly. And that's uh, where a lot of the value comes in from C is sharing content uh, with other people in a really secure manner um, so that you, know, you can be sure that only the people that you want to be listening to that content or seeing that content actually are. Um, the you know, other thing that is really important about C that differentiates it from you know, some other kind of consumer grade platforms is you know, that level of security goes all the way through the stack. So it's not just you, know, you have to log in to see something, uh, but there's things like forensic watermarking, which you know, the, the larger studios really care a lot about. Um, visual watermarking, if you want to make sure you've got your brand forward on your content and it sort of you know, spoils the video if you want it to. Um, and on the audio side, we really do, you know, some really unique things. Like we're very excited about this relatively new integration uh, with Dolby Atmos. Uh, people have been asking for it for a long time. And I think we did it in a really cool way, working very closely with Dolby in the sense that um, it's sort of, you don't have to do anything. You just upload your files and then uh, the magic happens behind the scenes and it just works the way that you would expect it to. And it's all kind of through a browser. So, uh, I'm excited to show that, and I think we'll do a demo of that hopefully a little bit later. Um, and I think, you know, that's, it, without uh, the risk of going on too long, I think that's a high level um, of, you know, kind of what C is used for. So storage and management. Uh, one thing that's pretty cool is you can enrich your content with as much metadata as you want. So if you've got a large library. Everybody knows trying to find things, especially years later, can be hard. So you can add whatever metadata you want to those files, which then makes them searchable. So you could search for you know, anything by artist or by title or by year, uh, easily find that content and then uh, access it as you need to. Nice. So it's a really robust and agile platform. Of course, it's very secure, but it's also you know really meant to meet the demands of people working globally. Um, and bringing them together to share these files and, and be able to preview them as well, which I think is a real differentiator um, for Sony C, you know, being able to provide a stereo representation of the Dolby Atmos mix and be able to listen to that directly through C um, on speakers or headphones and the binaural experience that you're going to share with us as well. It really truly is, you know, meeting the, the needs of um, the marketplace and the creative community. So um, if you would, or, or if you're ready to, um, would you mind sharing a little bit of the um, workflow uh, demonstration, please? 
All right, so this is C Media Cloud. Uh, I've logged in. Anybody can create a free account, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. So, um, you know, highly encourage you to go do that and play around a bit. Um, once you log in, you're presented with uh, a set of workspaces that you have access to. So everything in C is organized by these workspaces. Um, and a workspace is really just a place where you can invite people and you uh, can have files stored. Uh, and again, depending on your plan, you can have one or more of those workspaces. Uh, but I'll go ahead and just click into one of these. Uh, and I'm presented with uh, content that I've got access to in this particular workspace. So it looks pretty familiar, right? It's kind of like a file system. You can have whatever folders that you want. Uh, you can create them however you want to create them. You can move them around if you want to. Um, and they can be nested as deeply as you want. So you can really organize things however you want to organize them. Um, you can view things in different ways. So if you want to see large thumbnails um, of the content, you certainly can. I kind of like this view here. Um, and if I just jump into a particular folder here, I've, we've got some uh, Dolby Atmos content that has been uploaded. And uh, if I just kind of run through a couple of these, here's a file. I put a, a AI generated thumbnail on top of this just to differentiate it and be able to find it quickly. Um, but if I go ahead and click on that, we've got a lot of information, and this is sort of one of the differentiators of C um, versus some consumer platforms, is we, we really understand that our users care about the technical nature of the content. Um, so, for instance, if we uh, look down here, we can see lots of different metadata about it. So the general audio metadata, but then um, the Dolby Atmos information, uh, we extract from the file as well so that you can see that and, and uh, make sure it's everything that you... Uh, expect it to be. Um, so we make sure that that's visible to people. Um, and then on the element side, um, if I go ahead and click into the player, um, I can go ahead and play this and and one of the things that you'll notice is this actual file that, that uh, was uploaded was a 3.1 gigabyte file. It's an ADMB wave. Um, and yet I'm able to preview this right in my browser. So um, one of the things that I can do here is actually select between the um, Dolby Atmos Stereo and the Binaural. Uh, so C is going to automatically create both of those whenever you upload an ADMB WAV file. Uh, so if you wanted to listen to one or the other, you can easily switch that and just play it. You've got the right speaker set up or headphones, you'll be able to tell the difference. Uh, you're not going to be able to tell the difference on my laptop, uh, unfortunately, with, uh, you know, just playing directly out of the computer speakers. Um, but so those are automatically created, which means you can preview this from anywhere. One of the things that uh, makes this kind of a, an all-in-one platform is in addition to be able to upload it, manage it, search for it. Uh, and by the way, I can add additional metadata here. So I, I went ahead and put some. Uh, metadata against this file, the production name, Dolby Community Session. Uh, I'm in New York right now, so location, New York City, and a tag, um, not approved, right? And so maybe part of my workflow is I want to get this approved um, so I can update that tag to approved at some point if all things go well. Uh, and you can see here that the person who actually originally contributed this file or uploaded it into the platform uh, was Ben Guevara, our very own. So uh, that's captured there. Uh, the nice thing about having metadata is once it's there, I could just search for Ben Gavars and I'll find anything he's ever uploaded. So he's uploaded those two files. Um, I could search by any of this other additional information and I'll find it really easily. Okay, so one of the other things that you can do in addition to just storing the content is you can actually collaborate. Um, so you can get feedback from people. You don't have to be in the same studio in the same location traveling all over the place. Uh, you can let people listen to the content the way that it was supposed to be heard, and they can actually provide feedback in real time. Um, so if I click over here to the comments tab, I can see there's already some comments here. And, you know, it's really easy to, to do that. You click anywhere. Um, pause, and if I want to add a comment here, I'll say, you know, this is a new comment. New comment for the wall. Uh, and then they're all... Um, Time code based. So I can make that for a whole duration. So you can see this comment here, for instance, is for this section of the audio. Um, and again, it's collaborative. So it's just not me by myself. So, you know, if somebody else wanted to, for instance, add a reply to my con uh, comment here, um, as long as they have access to that asset, they can certainly do it. 
You see this just popped up down here that says one new comment. If I click on that, it takes me directly to that new comment. So Greg, who's um, you know part of the Dolby team, just added another comment and I get that feedback immediately. So we're able to go back and forth um, and make sure that all of our creative feedback is captured. Uh, it's not an email, it's not in text messages, it's right here. I can click straight on the uh, particular time code and go right to that particular location. So really powerful collaboration features. Um, and sometimes you don't really want to give people direct access to your workspace, right? This just may be for your trusted team. You don't want everybody to have access here. So uh, a real common feature is to be able to share that content. So I'll go ahead and just share. and I'm going to put that in a new media box. And a media box within C is just a way to securely share content. So uh, I can give it a name. It'll just default to the file name. Um, please review for... Uh, quality. And I can make this secure, which means somebody has to log in. Um, I can make it protected, which means they need a link and whatever password I generate. Um, or it could just be public. Uh, public, you know, use with caution. All they need is the link and they can get access to it. It's good for certain situations, but um, if you care about security or you're working with a studio, they're likely going to want you to use one of these. Um, so I'll go ahead and just do protected. And um, I have it make a password for me. I'm going to copy that because I'm going to want it for later. And then you can control what people can do. So maybe you just want them to listen to it and you want them to be able to comment. So I could say uh, allow comments in the media box. But I don't want them to see the comments that um, we just made. Uh, so I'm not going to let them see the comments from my internal team. But they can certainly add their own and I can reply to theirs. And then if we want to allow them to download the files, we can. They can either download the source file, that ADMB wave, or maybe they want to um, download the, um, the Dolby Atmos file. So if I uh, click on the elements and I actually just say all, then I'm going to be able to um, send those directly. I won't send those. And then create. And then if I... I can copy that link, I can send it to them. I could email it directly if we want to, um, but I'll just go ahead and open that, <clears throat> put the password in. And I get access to just that file. You'll notice I didn't allow download, so I can click on this, I can play it immediately. There's no waiting to download everything. And I could start adding comments as well. So comments on my shared media box. And now I can be collaborating with people that don't have access to my workspace. And the nice thing is, uh, if I go back to that, to that particular asset now, those new comments that I just entered, and I, I realized I wasn't sharing that screen, so you probably just didn't see me open that media box. But uh, I opened up another tab, and it just had access to that file, and I added a comment, and there it is back in my workspace. So even though I'm sharing that externally, all of the feedback comes back to one central location. All right, uh, one last thing that you can do if you're working on a, a project uh, where your audio is gonna be you know, meant for uh, some sort of video. One thing that you can do is you can take the uploaded audio and you can associate it directly with your video. So that's what I did with this particular uh, asset here. So if you're working on a music video or you're working on a you know, feature episodic or anything else, and you want to layer that audio track uh, directly into the video preview, uh, you can just basically go over to the elements and you can add that element um, directly to the video file, right? So I've done that already for this demonstration. So if I go here, you can see that I added an uploaded audio here and it's that same uh, ADM B-Wave track. Uh, so the cool thing about that is if I just play the regular audio on the source video, it's like... But if I want to change that and say, actually, I want to listen to uh, the Dolby Atmos stereo mix, uh, I can just like that. I'm able to preview it both with the original audio and then either uh, the stereo or binaural that was created for that element that I associated with. So you're really able to bring uh, the audio and the video experience together um, and you can collaborate on the video just as easy as you can on that audio. All right. I think that's all I wanted to show today. Um, so that would be the end of the demo. 
That is very cool. Thank you for sharing that. It offers so much flexibility. And I know I, I mentioned before, but it just, it ticks so many boxes that meet the demands of the creative community and the industry. It's a secure platform. It allows for the collaborative um, process to happen. There's tons of storage there. You're able to, you know, do video and audio and hear your, your Atmos uh, represented there as well, which is just, it, it's, it's pretty groundbreaking. So um, thank you for sharing all of that. For, for new users that want to get started or, or check out Sony C, um, where should they go? Uh, so they can go to steamediacloud.com. Um, and uh, once you're here, you can actually go ahead and click get started if you want to, so you can learn more about it. Uh, but get started, like I mentioned, you can create a free account um, and just requires your first name, last name, and an email address, and you can uh, start to play around. Now, one thing um, is the Dolby features uh, currently can't be enabled on the plans automatically, but you just pop a note to our customer success team and they can add it. Um, as an add-on to your plan. Uh, we're gonna change that here pretty soon so that it can be fully self-service. Um, it's a relatively new feature uh, that we're excited about, but uh, yeah, highly encourage you to go check it out. Yeah, thanks so much, David. That was that was great. I just wanted to kind of, uh, you know, just double down on a couple of things. So one, again, just, you know, how robust the uh, the, the, the platform is, you know, you, you're kind of checking a lot of boxes, as, as Ben said. So obviously the, you know, the storage and archival piece um, you know, being able to collaborate uh, and, you know, uh, you know, go back and forth with with clients is is really great. And of course, you know, obviously the, 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 the Dolby Atmos piece, but the, uh, the, the, the metadata being visible, uh, I think is really great. Like I'm actually, I've got the project open right now. And, you know, when we think about, certainly for a lot of our users are doing a lot of uh, their own QC and kind of looking at this metadata uh, and also making, trying to make sure that everything is, above board uh, as they kind of get their deliverables done. And this does a really great job of kind of presenting the metadata piece of it. So I'm looking at this this uh, on the demo that you just presented, you know, we've got uh, 10 bed channels and 99 object channels. We know it's uh, 5.1 and 5.1X uh, is done via direct render and just lots of great information. I'm looking through this and I shouldn't, I shouldn't be excited because it's metadata, but I am. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I point that out. Uh, I know we didn't really get to to, to see uh, you know the actual metadata uh, as you were kind of going through the demo, but just know for for all of our all of our viewers uh, in the in the community here that there's a lot of information that's going to be exposed here for you. Thanks, David, for that demonstration. If folks would like to ask questions, please do so in big marker here. Be sure to add your name to your questions so we can address you. And with that, let's go into Q and A. like to welcome our guests, uh, David, Obi, and Brandon back on for Q&A. Um, thanks to everyone who's pre-submitted and sent in questions already. Some we've already answered, some great questions that have come in, but um, if you have one that you would like answered now, please enter that and add your name along with it as well, please. Um, we'll start with one for you, Greg, um, from Guilio. What are the smallest ceiling speakers recommended for a small mixing room? Hey, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for the question. And uh, yeah, welcome, everybody. Uh, so in terms of, uh, you know, depending on your room size, we definitely recommend that you uh, use our Dart tool, which I'll, I'm going to put a link to here in the chat in just a second. Uh, there, you'll be able to enter your room dimensions, you know, exactly what you're working with, the space of your room, you know, what kind of uh, additional surfaces you might uh, be, you know, working with. And uh, in the Dart, you can actually there's a, a you know, pull down where you can choose your uh, choose manufacturer and the uh, the models that they have specifically uh, you know in the Dart. Uh, we don't you know like to make any specific recommendations. We you know, don't want to we, we we think all of our uh, you know, manufacturers who are meeting spec are great. Uh, you know mileage will definitely vary in terms of you know what you want to. You know, use so we do recommend using the Dart, uh, and you can try out and actually see what uh, what will work in your room. The Dart does a really great job of uh, letting you know if something uh, obviously meets spec, but meets spec specifically for your room as it re relates to SPL uh, and other things. So go ahead and use the Dart, and I'll go ahead and pop that in the uh, a link to the, the Dart directly in the in the chat for everybody. 
Right on. Thanks, Greg. And we've done several music community sessions on the Dart with Emma um, and even going back further with, with Brian on exactly how to use that tool and how to um, what considerations to make when it comes to rooms of different uh, sizes and um, even speaker manufacturers. We had a great session with um, Focal and Haverstick Design getting into some of that as well. So um, we'll be sure to pop those resources in here as well. And you can go to the music community sessions page on our YouTube channel to see all of those. Um, Another one for you here, Greg, from uh, Gseth. What are the requirements to tune into a Dolby Atmos music? And so not 100% sure if they're, they're talking about tuning a room or, or best practices there, but um, oh, maybe oh. we can touch on a couple different parts. Sure, yeah, that all applies. Uh, so uh, for tuning a room, obviously, yeah, we do in our best practices, which I'll go ahead and share the link to that. Uh, we've actually updated that uh, in the last uh, month and a half or so. Uh, you know, we there are some recommendations around uh, minimum room size, although there there is some 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 flexibility there, a little bit of flexibility depending on what you're working with in terms of the size of your room. Uh, we do recommend that you have your room tuned. Now there are uh, uh, you know uh, several different ways to do that. So I believe uh, you're coming to us from India. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, you know, if there's a, a, a certified service partner uh, in that area, we can certainly look at that. But uh, we can also, if you want to. You know, we've uh, Ben just mentioned that we've had um, some really great guests on previously, including Emma Brooks. Uh, we've had Brian Pennington, who uh, is an amazing room tuner here at Dolby, uh, talking about uh, ways you know ways that you can actually approach uh, getting make, making sure that you're you know getting getting tuning for your room and you know, tuning it accurately. Um, and um, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and share the link to the latest best practices uh, here in the chat for everyone. And in that, again, that gives you everything that you need to know in terms of room size, speaker placement. Uh, we do recommend, again, going back to the previous link on the uh, leveraging the Dart so that you know we have a really good, um, uh, really good information on what your room setup is. And then there's information there on, on tuning, uh, how that can be done, different ways uh, you can kind of leverage your IO, or in some cases, uh, the Dolby Atmos render itself, if, you, if you're if your IO doesn't support uh, holding of a, of a, a, a profile and yeah, different, different ways you can definitely take a look at that. So I've just sent that link in the chat for everyone. Thanks, Greg. All right, uh, Brandon, over to you for one from our buddy, Sam. What's up, Sam? Thanks for the questions and thanks for always uh, attending these. Great to see you. Uh, the Dolby Atmos Music Accelerator website is a fantastic resource. Is there anything that I should point eager learners to? Um, and is there a page for users of Logic Pro as other creators might be using other DAWs and Logic Pro is great to use with the external Atmos renderer for you, Brandon? Yeah, um, I would definitely point people towards, I mean, the website is set up to kind of go from ideation to distribution for Dolby Atmos and understanding how you can mix, how your fans can listen to this music, how you can QC, how you can find a studio. So I would definitely explore each of the tabs and all the content that it is underneath of the tabs. Um, for Logic Pro specifically, in the mixing section, um, there are exercises for Logic Pro and there's also quick start videos for Logic Pro as well. Um, and then if you move over to the advanced learning tab of that website, uh, it will link you to our Dolby Atmos music curriculum. And there's a deep dive, a technical deep dive into uh, begin uh, mixing Logic Pro. Awesome, great, thanks. So dolby.com slash institute, you can get to uh, the learning management Four system five. from there, the music essentials curriculum and all of the accelerator material, which is fantastic as well. So. Great stuff. Thanks, Brandon. Okay, Greg, over to you for one, and I'm going to un unpack this one a little bit. There's a, a few pieces to it from, from BZ here. So um, this is going back to some of the things we talked about in previous sessions, Greg, with Stereo Direct. Um, I create my Atmos and Stereo files in the same session using the Stereo Direct option. Problem is that when I switch to Stereo, Triple no direct stereo direct monitoring, the audio in the center channel gets added to the overall mix. So either I have to not use the center channel at all or do another mix and turn down my center, center channel by 6 dB or so before bouncing the stereo file. It would be wonderful if this were an option in the trim and down mix settings. So that's kind of the first piece there. And then we have options for trim and down mix for surround and height. Why isn't there an option for center channel reduction? Yeah, great question. And by the way, this this is a, a request, not just for uh, Stereo Direct 2.0, uh, 
uh, this has been a request for other down mixes uh, as, as well. So of course, center, so the, 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 to first answer the, the, the question is why, why doesn't it, uh, it exist? It's a separate algorithm. And so not, that's not to say it's not, it's, it's impossible, but there's a lot of, a, there's a lot of uh, specific work that needs to go into that to make sure that if we do, if we were able to uh, provide a trim and down mix control for the center channel, that it would do exactly what it needs to do. So what I have done is I've taken this, I've sent the uh, information and the request over to the dev team. They came right back and said, yeah, we've, 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 we've heard this, we've gotten this uh, request. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens now. You also mentioned uh, a, a workflow that you're doing in terms of, you know, uh, if it's a vocal or let, let's just say it's a vocal kind of, you know, having to, you know, kind of do another, an, an additional pass and bring that center channel back around, you know, somewhere around 6 dB. And that is exactly kind of the, 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 the right workflow. There are a few different ways to kind of get there. And probably the easiest way that, um, you know, as I was talking to uh, Finn Barnes and Jordan Glasgow yesterday, one of the easiest workflows that we can think of is, uh, and Finn is the one that kind of uh, mentioned it, is, you know, just using in internal rendering in Pro Tools, you can actually just set that vocal send in that center channel uh, to the 2.0 direct render and set that at minus, let's say, 6 dB in this case. Uh, you can always, you know, try it out and, uh, and, and uh, adjust as need. Uh, but that way, if you're trying to do a kind of a, you know, general uh, deliverables where you're just kind of, you know, you kind of want to measure twice and cut once, uh, that's a really quick and easy way you can do that. But I have sent that information over to the dev team, and you know, um, we, you know we're always we're always super happy to uh, to take uh, feedback and, and, and request. Awesome, thanks, Greg. Thanks for the question, BZ. Great, great question. Um, another one for you, Greg. This is on Pro Tools re-renders. How can I play back re-renders in Pro Tools if I'm using the Pro Tools audio bridge when there's no send and return plugin from Michael or Macau? Yeah, great one. Uh, so the the reason, so yeah, there, there there's no there's no uh, you know send. Uh, plug in for that. So you actually don't need to leverage uh, either the Dolby Audio Bridge if you were trying to do that, do something with the external, uh, you know, the Dolby Atmos render or uh, Pro Tools Audio Bridge. Uh, internal rendering in Pro Tools features unlimited uh, delay compensated re renders. So you just simply have to make sure that you're selecting the engine that reflects your monitoring environment uh, in the uh, uh, core audio settings uh, in Pro Tools for internal rendering. And I'm going to go ahead and, and just quickly share my screen. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that uh, that can get a little bit lost in translation a little bit is um, understanding the uh, where everything is in the Pro Tools um, uh, render window. So let me go ahead and yep. quickly uh, just show that. So you should be seeing right yep. about now. Yeah. So we're here in the Pro Tools uh, renderer uh, UI, and you can see here there's a little uh, settings button. Again, this was moved a couple of a version or two ago. When we go ahead and open that up, you can see that you've got your custom re renders here. Now I'm going to go ahead and click that. I'm going to have to go ahead and switch to a different screen so you can actually see that. And there we go. And here is actually where you can go ahead and set that up. Uh, you can actually set up an entirely different new custom. Uh, uh, monitor and re-render right there. So just wanted to make sure I, I showed that quickly. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's actually pretty simple. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for doing that. Um, great question, Mikhail. Um, I could take this next one from Raleigh. <clears throat> for music consumption, it seems like we've gone from mono to stereo to surround and then back to, to stereo. And now we're making another attempt at surround. Um, Question is, do general consumers actually know about Atmos or immersive listening for music, or is it just for audio enthusiasts? Can you highlight any stats and data showcasing uh, consumption habits for new listening experiences by the general consumer? This is a great question, and it's something that the music partnerships team and, and many of us at Dolby take a lot of time to try to illustrate and educate the community on. We've done a lot of community sessions and in-market events, industry events, talking about these things. But I think it's important to remember that, you know, Dolby Atmos is part of a global end-to-end -end ecosystem that, of course, begins with the creator, but is distributed, again, globally to over 3 billion devices with the B and services out in the marketplace. Um, some numbers that are pu published are, for example, 92% of Billboard's top 100 artists for 2023 have music available in Dolby Atmos. Um, today, there are 20 streaming music services globally. Of course, you know, Apple, Amazon, and Tidal are the ones that most folks are 
familiar with here in the States, but there are also regional services such as Angami, Hangama, QQ in China, uh, Melon in Korea, um, and several others. Um, there are 20 automobile manufacturers announced or on the road today enabled for Dolby Atmos, including global brands such as Cadillac and Mercedes, Rivian, Volvo, um, Polestar, Lucid, and there are over 1,100 studios globally meeting best practices. And again, distribution to over 3 billion devices. So um, it is global. It uh, continues to grow and um, adoption continues to, to grow across the ecosystem as well. You can certainly go to our site to, to see more details and more of the partners that are part of that ecosystem. Um, there are some sessions that we did live in Nashville a couple of weeks ago that have now been published on our, our YouTube channel where we go through an in-depth um, kind of overview of the ecosystem, everything from the tools to studios, to labels, to services and, and devices, a deep dive with um, head of music industry relations, Christine Thomas, that you might find interesting. And if you have any questions or, or need anything, you can always email uh, musicrelations at dolby.com, but um, a great, great question and something that continues to grow and we do a lot of work uh, to educate on as well. So thank you for that question, Raleigh. Um, one for you, Brandon, um, and I'm gonna say this in my terrible Spanish, uh, but uh, Dolby para Latinos from our friend Diego, who, who asks this question many times. So hopefully, Diego, we can get you an answer here, but I'll I'll hand it over to Brandon to uh, to respond. Yeah, um, I mean, if you're asking about just music creation for Spanish speakers, I mean, en español tenemos un montón de recursos en español en, en nuestro sitio. Hay un curriculum de Dolby Atmos Music que también está disponible en español. Um, además, tenemos un, un montón de videos súper buenos en español que explican to, todo uh, desde cómo crear uh, música en español y más. Y en el próximo año vamos a tra traducir la página y los videos en español uh, sobre, sobre la, la programa. Si tiene alguna pregunta adicional uh, sobre cómo hacer el, algo específico, en lo veamos hay un correo electrónico donde puede escribirlo en español y te responderemos en, en español también. Thank you, Brandon. Gracias. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, Diego, that answers your question. And, and if you are still, you know, in need of some information or have any questions, please go ahead and email us. We want to make sure that we, we answer your question correctly and can get you um, exactly what it is that you need, because I know that you're you're active on these sessions and um, have this question a lot. So, um, Greg, over to you for one. And this is uh, a, li a little bit vague, but maybe we can touch on a couple of different points here. And the question is from Solomon. It's, and it's simply, you know, question about producing spatial audio in Dolby Atmos. That That is the question. Yeah, so I think the answer is, I think that's what we've also been talking about in this in this series, uh, as I've been talking about creating an Atmos, right? So there are, you know, at, with music creation, there, there are a few different phases. There's the inception, the, you know, the writing and the, the, the creation and the ideation through the ideas. Uh, there's the, the you know, arranging and mixing uh, piece of it. And of course, then there's the, uh, you know, uh, delivering that pre-master, getting that mastered, and then delivering it out into the world. So in this, you know, we've just kind of done the second part of the music creation and Atmos series. Again, not much is different. So now uh, being able to leverage uh, low latency in, in, in uh, any of the DAWs or the DAWs that feature um, internal rendering, uh, most of them anyway, uh, and we'll continue making sure that the partners have what they need and they'll be, you know, uh, you know uh, releasing uh, new versions uh, that feature that. Uh, but you know, being able to be able, you know, uh, monitor and track in low latency, uh, that actually gets you really far in terms of, you know, as you saw, maybe if, if you and if you haven't, go back to the last uh, previous uh, community sessions where I showed uh, creating and just coming up with ideas, and some of those ideas were already they were they were you know conceived in uh, with the idea of having them at Atmos, and we just went ahead and tracked them uh, directly uh, as objects, or in some cases in the bed already where we had a general idea where they were going to go we can change our minds and that's the beauty of of uh, of being creative and i don't know maybe obi anything you wanted to add to that i completely agree i think there's no one right answer now um especially with where technology is going and where these dolls are bringing us thank goodness um the lines are blurred between the mixing stage and the creation stage. So now you can just do it all as it comes to you. 
love it. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And hopefully, Henny, that that answers your question as well. So um, uh, if not, feel free to follow up. Um, David, over to you for one. Um, from Jason, where do I add the Dolby Atmos option on the Sony C site? Great question. So uh, you can actually do it directly on the site. But if you drop a line to our uh, customer success team, they can turn it on for you. That's going to change in the new, near future. So uh, it's a relatively new feature that we've made available to our enterprise customers on the enterprise accounts. But we're going to make that available to all of the pro and team and business accounts as well. So you'll just be able to toggle that on as a, as a separate option. But in the interim, uh, drop a line uh, to our team. I think there's a contact us. If not, I'll put their uh, email address in the chat right now so that you can hit them up directly. Great. Thank you. And there was also a comment in the chat, David, that said, um, just FYI, the link to the service is actually cimediacloud.com. Um, I'm not yeah. sure if somebody had a different site uh, at some point, but we'll just pop the correct one into uh, the chat here as well. Okay. Good deal. Cool. Thanks. Um, last one here from our buddy Sam. And and for we'll start with you, Obi. Well, I guess this one really is for you, Obi. But if, Brandon, if you want to follow up. Um, Thanks for the accelerator and the in-person events. Um, did, Obi, did you learn anything more at the events? Any useful tips for the mix, for example? Tons, actually. Um, the main thing just being surrounded by other creatives, you kind of just get to watch and learn as other people learn and see their approaches. So it's just all about approach that I've, I've been learning things. There's, again, no one right answer to these things. There's just different options. Um, so yeah, it's just really it's just been different tools in my my little tool bag that I've been able to pull out, um, such as I really love the object bed and going about implementing that. There's just all types of different ways you can go about being creative. Wonderful, Brandon. Anything to to add to that? No, I can't. I can't add to what Obi's been learning, but I've definitely seen Obi learning a lot over the the years so that we've been working together. All right, wonderful. Well, you guys have done such an amazing job evolving the program, and uh, it continues to bring new creators into the fold and provide them with resources. Um, thank you to all of our presenters and guests today. This was a really informative and very cool episode with a lot of different uh, information, different ways to work, different solutions out there in the marketplace, educational resources. So um, thank you, everybody, for the amazing questions. With that, I'd like to thank David Rosen, Obi Brown, Brandon Nales, of course, my partner, Greg Chin, for another excellent session. We'll get this up on the uh, YouTube channel and the pro site soon. And with that, we'll wrap. See you Thanks, next everyone. time.